and we are here in continuation of our Florida in Focus Week wake up call down in Florida. Hashtag wake up call everywhere. Also the hashtag wake up call OTR or wake up call on the road. So we are down in Florida and we have dedicated this week each day. I picked one person and that person is being honored here in our Florida in focus wake up call with Dan Tortora. Kind of like seeing any talk show go anywhere. We're spotlighting people from the state of Florida that we connect with. And Papa Joe is with us every Thursday. So you know for our Thursday Florida in, Flo Florida in Focus special, there's nobody else that can be here except for PJ, PJ. So I am very happy to welcome him to the show. And for the first time ever, you get to see the man on video. Papa oh Joe, how are we doing? Oh my goodness. I hope I don't break the camera. <laughs> <laughs> so how how are you? What's what's going on? How's Good Florida? Enough. And this is a nice... Nice. Uh, going to be a rainy day today. I don't think that Daytona 500 is going to get off today. Uh, they usually start at 1230 and there's a huge storm coming. So for all the fans down there, I think that's going to be that's going to be bad. Mary's, Mary's getting ready to go to church. I've already said my mass on EWTN and here I am. So, you know, you and I talk about a lot of different things here with Florida in Focus on this special here for you on Thursday, February 25th. It is uh, my honor and my privilege to speak with Papa Joe, as we always do every Thursday morning. Uh, first time PJ's on video. Uh, Papa Joe, what I, I don't know any other place in our Florida and Focus special than to start right here. And that is why, 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 why is Jameis Winston the butt of all your jokes? Oh, my man, Jameis. What's up, Jameis? <laughs> uh, well, I just remember Jameis from years ago when he was, trying to get through junior college and uh, I guess they bought himself a championship and then he went to Florida state and they bought himself a championship there. So I don't know. Jamie's a good athlete. I just, I just quarrel with him because he just got to use his head a little bit more. That's all. And I tease him. I think he, he ought to be a, he ought to learn something behind Drew Brees. I, you can't be dumb all your life. My God, you got to play quarterback in this league. You got to be <laughs> smart. I mean, he just is not smart. Jameis Winston <laughs> the connection to Florida state, your beautiful bride, Miss Mary is a Florida is a Florida state Seminole Tomahawk chalk here. And you are, you're the Gator chomp. So it's how me. do you, how do you deal with that in the household, Florida versus Florida state? Well, you know, Mary was a, a professor there for several years, uh, years ago, of course, but and she, she still hasn't lost her uh, Florida state side where she, she gets in, into me every once in a while. But we had fun with it. I remember years ago when we were just first married and we were, uh, yeah. <clears throat> um, of course, Florida, Florida State on, on television was a huge game. And uh, <clears throat> she would wear her Florida, Florida State shirt. And I would wear my Gator shirt. And we would go shopping uh, at one of the malls. And I think it was uh, the Friday, the, the Friday after uh, Thanksgiving, which is a huge shopping day. And boy, we used to get a lot of people teasing us. Uh, we were holding hands, walking down this, walking down the aisles there, and looking in the stores to see if we could find a score. But uh, I, I bested her a few times that time. You know, and and for for you going like Florida, Florida State is a massive rivalry nationally. But you and Mary get along. I have to ask you though: Have you broken the Florida State cup that I got her? Absolutely not. No, she's got <laughs> it, and she she takes care of it, Daniel. Okay. Uh, she's, she's, she knows, she knows what that, she knows where that's from. So, so for, for you, what's it like having that in the house? I mean, do, will you watch Florida, Florida state together? No, we don't watch football anymore, Daniel. We will, I'll catch a game every once in a while, but uh, if, if I do, it's only for a half or something like that. And she'll, she'll wander in and say, how are things going? And uh, you know, but she's not interested in it anymore. Now, not as much as I am, obviously. Yeah, she she left Florida State years ago, and yeah, you know she doesn't have any friends anymore, and all her students have all grown up and got jobs of their own, and uh, she was there for a long, long, long time. She was there for I would say eleven or twelve years. And one of her jobs I remember was to uh, to help tutor some of the football players, which she she got a pretty good awakening with that. Let me tell you that when she realized some of the skills that these guys have or don't have, you know. Yeah. And that was part of her, that was part of her job. Go to Mrs. 
her name then was Barnes, go to Mrs. Barnes' uh, class, sit there and listen. <laughs> You know, and, and, and for you, you were both teachers, uh, you know, in, in, in another chapter. What did you take away from teaching? What did you learn about it? And just what you could say about, you know, life as a teacher? Well, I was very fortunate that I was being selected for these, for the position I was looking at. Uh, some of the, the, some friends of mine that were already teachers are saying, Joe, this is not a, this is not an easy situ- situation. You don't, you don't go into dropout prevention or at-risk kids, you know, being goody-goody, you gotta be tough. So when I first got the job, I was I was a little apprehensive, but I, I learned well and uh, I, I, I stated, uh, stated my case. One thing that Papa Jay has when he's in the classroom is what's called command presence. And you don't fool around with command presence. You gotta go in, you gotta state it the very first day. You don't fool around. If they have to throw a kid out on the very first day, you throw him out. My classroom were, was bent on structure and discipline, and that's the way I operated my classes. That's the way my students learned. And if they didn't like it, they left. They probably go to jail, but <laughs> you don't walk out of Papa Jay's class. But. What, you know, being a teacher in history and dealing with, you know, at risk and all of that, what did it teach you about society? What did it teach you about what we need to do? Because a lot of the kids that were in your classroom were written off by their parents, their grandparents, their siblings, their guardians. You know, they were written off. They were, they were expected to fail. And you had them and you tried to help them succeed. What did that teach you about life that sometimes you were getting these kids come through the door that people already didn't believe in and they were so young? Well, the first thing you realize is these children are needy. Uh, they, they, you're right. They come from broken homes. They don't come from any homes at all. Some live with their grandma and their grandpa. Some live in a car. It's sad. I mean, it's sad. But as a teacher, you recognize what type of emotional turmoil they're, they're under. If you happen to, if, if a kid happened to act out in class and you realize that it's not anything that I did or maybe the principal did or anything like that, it's something per- perhaps maybe uh, that happens at home. So I would definitely call the guidance counselor and she would take that student in there and, and try to talk he or she down to where she could come back in and, and, and uh, be, be in a class. So, you know, it's a, you gotta be, you gotta be, you have, you have several hats on when you're an at-risk kid teacher, you know, and the, the biggest one is discipline. I mean, these kids, <laughs> these kids are there for a reason. They, 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 they've broken the law. Uh, they've, <clears throat> They've upset the learning environment at school. That's a, that's a favorite one right there. Anyway, they, they, they've, they've been thrown out. They go into uh, the center like uh, Gaines, where, right, where I was at. And, and that's where they learn to get back on track, if they choose to. If they don't choose to and they keep on acting up, then if they're 16 years old, they go to jail. And for some, that's a sobering, very sobering thought. And... It's very sobering if it actually happened to you. Now, there's nothing, there's nothing worse than seeing your bud thrown in the back of a police car and thrown off to jail. So, it's, but you know, you deal with it. Usually, these kids are away for ten days or so, and then they come back and they have a better attitude, and then they try to learn. And they, my biggest problem with the at-risk kids is they just didn't have any skills. And you find you find yourself in a situation where you're teaching a lot. And you're also reteaching a lot. And the, these kids don't have the basic knowledge that, that got them this far. I mean, there are some kids that um, I, I'd have, oh, let me see a good example. I've had an 16 year olds in the, in the sixth grade. I mean, you're not supposed to be 16 years old when you're in the sixth grade. I mean, but with that, they, they bring nothing with them. Most of the time, those kids fail and they don't make it. They get out of Mr. Lando's flat. That's fine. They'll go somewhere else and Maybe it'll get out of the school for one year and then the next few they're back right in again or they're back in jail or so. It's, um, I, I used to equate it with odds that I had when I was in the racing industry. If I were to get one out of a hundred kids to graduate high school going through our program there, that was a lot. And we, uh, that, that was pretty emotional. You know, and, and that, speaking here with Papa Joe, 
in our Florida in Focus special on, on uh, Thursday, February 25th from the Sunshine State. For you, PJ, like you said, that to get one out of 100, that would be something special and it was very emotional. In 2020, schools got shut down. Uh, people couldn't go to school. They some, some of us in some places couldn't go anywhere. But what can you say about the school system and what you've seen over this past year, knowing that some kids going to school, that was their only hot meal of the day, going to school, they felt safe. You know, people forget that going to school for some people was the safest place they were, the best food they had, the best interaction that they had, maybe the only guardian or positive reinforcement that they had in their life. So having these schools shut down, including the at-risk youth, just how you feel as an, as an educator through history to know that the kids you were teaching, you know, that there's kids just like that, that in this past year were at home with no leadership, no direction, and some of them, no food, no help. No computers either. <laughs> so if they're, if they're uh, doing it online or uh, yeah. from, from home, they, they probably don't have uh, uh, enough there, but you know, we're very fortunate that, the school system that we're involved in down here is the St. John's County school system. And for the last 10 years in a row, the St. John's County school district has been the number one school district in the state of Florida. And number one is, 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 is we're very thankful for that. And, but it takes a lot more work on my end as an at-risk teacher uh, to try to get these kids up to snuff because the only way they can measure things is, is by testing. And testing is the worst thing for kids. Some kids don't want to be tested. They don't care about being tested. All they want to do is sit in class and learn. You know, you, you give them a test, a quiz every once in a while, and then you put them in front of a, if you put them in front of a proctored uh, test and they freeze and they just don't, they don't, they know right ahead that they're not good enough to get to go forward, uh, that that's the biggest problem. And I'm not sure. Of course, I've been away from the school district now for 14 years. I things have changed an awful lot in the school district. The school district is still number one. I have to agree with that. But the only the thing that they've gotten away from over the years is the structure and discipline that some of the old guys like I had that came into the school system used. They don't, you know, they collect everyone in a little circle. They got their little laptops and they do this and they do that. It, I don't know how the hell you learn anything that way, but uh, that's that's the new teacher way of doing it. So that's 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 about it. I mean, it, things are entirely different now from when I was there 14 years ago. So for you, what did this country lose without having students in a classroom? Well, you know, you have to have face time. You have to have bricks and mortar time. You know, it's fine to have all the on the uh, offsite uh, learning centers and things like that, but there's nothing better than to sit in front of a, a, a teacher and listen. There's a, there's a little phrase I used to lose all the time. Uh, uh, sometimes the kids would act up in class, and even in my class, even with my structure and discipline. And I would say, you know, what's your problem this morning? They said, well, you know, I don't really don't want to come to school. I said, listen, I said, you're here. You know what my class is about? You don't, you know, you just got to sit there and you got to learn. Listen, if you don't want to, participate if you want to learn then you sit there and you learn things by assimilation and of course that kills them right there and i they, they say what and i says assimilation every every desk has a dictionary underneath your desk take the dictionary out look up assimilation try to spell it the best you can and see what it means yeah. and that that stopped them a lot you know and and here with Papa Joe inside of Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, Cafe Kubal Studios, Florida, in focus this week as Wake Up Call is on the road. Hashtag Wake Up Call O T R in the hashtag Wake Up Call everywhere. Can we, <clears throat> in your opinion, after losing so much in 2020, can we get it back? Can we get the kids on course? Can we get them on track? I mean, is what happened in 2020? I mean, what is the domino effect of that from an educator's perspective? And can we, can we make it better? Well, in my opinion, if you're not learning in the classroom, you're not learning. I mean, it's fun to be online. It's fun to do a, a project online. If you just, 
the teacher gives you an, an assignment, you can do it online and feel good about yourself. But, uh, you know, it, it's not just learning. It's, it's trying to achieve something and trying to better yourself, especially in the situations that I was in. Uh, I would love to see my kids go through my class and not have any discipline problems, but that's not, that's not where it is. And to answer your question a little bit more, is that the schools, in my opinion, the schools, and especially in our district and in the surrounding areas, have gotten away from the structure and discipline. They want the kids to be more involved, engaged in the class, whether you're a breakup kid or not, you know, you sit there and you on your little computer and do your little puzzles or whatever, you know. But I don't I don't see this going anywhere. I think this is probably gonna set us back a couple of years. Um, they're gonna they're gonna pass the kids somehow. They'll they'll get get them into the next grade. Uh, hopefully next year or by September that this, you know, the COVID will be uh, over with, but I, I don't see that happening either. And if you have, if you have, if we have to start next year in, in uh, September, like we did this last year, we're in trouble. Yeah, coming here from Papa Joe this morning on Wake Up Call and, you know, to educators out there, what do you want to say to the educators out there, to the teachers and the administrators that are trying to uh, find a way and trying to make this happen with every state being different and having different rules and ways they go about things. And some look similar and some look totally uh, different from each other. What is your advice to the educators out there? Well, first of all, they're heroes. You know, every teacher in the classroom is a hero. It's, uh, it's a hell of a profession. It's not easy. If people think it's easy, it's not. It's because you got a couple months off in the summertime not that way. Uh, the, um, you know, there's, there's, there's certain, there's certain areas that a person needs to, uh, grow in. And a lot of that is just being in front of a person and responding back and forth with, 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 uh, questions and answers. I used to do that a lot. I would tutor a lot with my little kids. If, if for, for some reason, one kid did, was doing well, well, come see Mr. Orlando during his planning time and he can, he can uh, uh, do something with you and help you a little bit more. But the, the schools are up against it now. You got schools all. You got school systems all over the country now that don't want to go back to bricks and mortar. Chicago being one, Chicago is the third, yeah, third largest school system in the, in the Florida, and uh, they struck. <laughs> the teachers didn't want to go back to class, and, the, and the, the mayor says, "Listen, you go back to class or you're out." And that goes back and forth. I don't know what the disposition of that is yet, but you know, here it is, where are we? We're in the middle, uh, the middle of February already, and some of the school districts are not even open yet. I mean, how, how, can, you achieve, how can you achieve some semblance of organization if, you don't, if you're not even in a class? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's not easy. Uh, and I would assume that, that a lot of teachers uh, perhaps maybe will be looking outside the industry for something better. Uh, and then, and that, I, I say that very carefully too, because some, when you're a teacher, you're, you're really in it for life, but sometimes you get so frustrated with the bureaucracy and this, and that, that, you know, Hey, this isn't working for me. I better do something else with my education. You know, and to take it from the education side of it and to spin it back into sports, uh, urban Meyer was a coach at Florida. And then he, you know, had to leave for other reasons and personal reasons and health and whatever, ends up at Ohio State, and then he steps down, but he stays on the staff as like a special administrative data, whatever, whatever, and, you know, he's not going to coach again, and now he's coaching the Jaguars. What are your thoughts on Urban Meyer's yes, no, yes, no, I am, I'm not, I'm in it, I'm out of it, I can't do it. I will do it. I never said I couldn't do it. I think I'm going to do it. What do you, what do you think about the urban Meyer saga? Well, I, I warned people about him. <laughs> now he's already showed his ass already. Uh, he, he, uh, he hired a strength and positioning coach from his years in Ohio state. And the gentleman had some issues with race and some other issues. I'm sure. Uh, if he was a bigot, he's a bigot all the way through. Uh, I guess he the strong arm methods that he used wasn't working, so they uh, they throw him out of there. So what does Urban do? He says, "Well, you know, this guy's sound. I've known him for 20 years. He's a good. Oh, he's great with the kids. He he, he can help help the program." 
So Urban hires him. You know, and all of a sudden, the pundits from all over the country are saying, what in the hell is he doing? What is he doing? Why would he do something like this? Why would he, do- after all the problems that he had at Florida and Ohio State, especially trying to cover up for one of his guys that were beat up his wife, they had to take three, they, they suspended him for three games. Uh, Urban uh, was suspended for three games. And, and he comes right over here and he makes the same mistake that he's done before. For some reason, he's not, he doesn't get it sometimes. Maybe he's got a, a, a tough side to him that, that likes to see the rough stuff. But I, I don't think so because he's got women and got daughters and his wife that probably beat him up a little bit. But, you know, that, so, so what does is, what is this poor young man do? What does he do if he resigns after, after, the, after one day, not even maybe two days? So the guy had a rosy picture in front of him. He thought maybe that his uh, evil deeds were in the past and was someone brings him up and the guy says, Urban, I, I can't do this to you. I can't do it to the school. I can't do it to the JAG, so I'm going to have to resign. That's Urban. Urban Meyer as an NFL head coach. We've seen him win as a college football coach. We've seen him win two championships at Florida. We've seen him, you know, obviously bring help us to see Tim Tebow in, in Gator Orange and Blue. And he went on to Ohio State and won a championship there. Do you think he's the answer in Jacksonville? Do you think he can win there? You know, his, his whole style, I think, needs to change. Uh, he's got to realize that he's with men now. And he's got to we, – we talked about this just a couple of days ago. He has got to win over the locker room. He has to. And especially the brothers. You know, the, the, everyone's always – they all were, they're all aware of Urban as a coach and how he runs programs and things like that. He's, he's just, he's, he is a genius when it comes to that. But the problem is he's always got some knuckleheads that are causing him problems, especially the 31 arrests he had in Florida when he was there. He can't have that. Now, what is he going to do when he sees his, his, uh, his group of guys in front of him? He's going to give them, you know, read him the riot act, going to do this, got to behave yourself, that, 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 that. So what, is, what happens if the first time – one of his guys acts up and got pinched for DUI or something like that. What's he going to do? You know, Urban will say, oh, he's a good guy. Uh, you know, he beats his made a mistake. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I'll suspend him, but he'll be out of practice for a couple of days, and maybe he'll play in the next game. Maybe he won't. Uh, you know, that's a wishy-washy Urban, and that's the way he is. What did you, beyond that, what did you learn as a Gator fan? What did you learn of Urban Meyer when he was with the Florida Gators? Well, he could do no wrong. I mean, until it caught up with him in the third year, third or fourth year, I think. It got caught up with him. Some of the, the, the renegades that he had on the, on the team were just, they didn't care about school. They weren't going to graduate. Uh, they were selling drugs. They, were, they had guns in their cars. and It's just it, it, a mess, a mess. And it all, happens, it all has to do with his recruiting. And he just didn't recruit the best guys. And he had, you always hear me use the term edge. He, he's what he recruited. He recruited edge players. If he could keep them on edge, they would be okay. If not, uh, he'd have to suspend them or keep them off the team for a week or something like that. But, uh, you know, he's got he's to change his mind when it comes to the, the pros. These are men. These are not kids. And you can't, you can't shape them like you can kids. So the first, you know, the first guy to is going to bow up to him. What's he going to do? Uh, you know, if he's going to, if you're going to bow up to me, then, you know, I'm going to set you on the sideline. He's got to be tough. You know, and I, I think what's what it, what's up with your sign? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think I, I'm just, t- I'm touching it for, I'm touching it for good luck. I want to have a yeah. pumpkin shot and show it, up it, in my staying up there. The studio. So looking at the Urban Meyer issue, like you said, uh, having guys that came in that kind of catch up with you, bringing in guys that are talented, but also, you know, have issue. Uh, those guys that I warned everybody about years in advance, Jalen Ramsey, Yannick Ngakwe, Telvin Smith, and Marcel Darius, they're all gone. So is it a clean slate for Urban? I mean, are you afraid he's going to bring in another Ramsey who's really, really good, but has a massive ego and causes a lot of trouble? I mean, are you afraid that Jacksonville got rid of the talent that was also a problem 
and that he's going to bring in that type of talent again of these, you know, fringe guys that maybe he's going to bring guys in that are going to be a problem in the locker room again. Well, he's, he wants to win, Daniel. That's the first thing. And he's going to bring in someone who's going to make him win. If he bring if he brings in a guy that maybe uh, uh, was suspended a couple games because of he was drunk or something like that, or maybe had an incident in the parking lot and the, the cops got him out of the misdemeanor and things like that, he'll take that guy. He'll take that guy. If he's a good football player, he'll play for Urban. $74.9 million in open cap space. More than anybody in the country. Not the first time in the last decade that Jacksonville's had 70-something million to play with. So they have all this money. They have more money than anybody else in the country. And in the top 10 calorie, uh, salary cap space, I think number 10 has like 20-something. They from, from their spot to number 10 is like $50 million of the space that they have. That's the difference between one and, and 10 or who has the most ca- salary cap space to the 10th uh, team in the NFL that has the most, so to speak. So what are your thoughts on Jacksonville has more money than anybody, almost $75 million to spend. They have 10 draft picks, two in the first round, two in the second, one in the third to start things off. How do you botch this? I guess is what I'm saying with having more money than anybody and having plenty of draft picks, including the number one pick. Well, I think that he's going to have to rely on Trent Belkey for that. I think that that's the reason he's there. Uh, he should have been hired months ago instead of dallying around like this. Uh, he's a proven guy, first-class guy. He's the one that knows all the X's and O's when it comes to this kind of stuff. Urban will say, listen, I want to draft this kid. What do we know about this kid? And they'll confer about it, and they'll say, well, maybe he's not the best guy, character guy right now, but he's a hell of a player. I says, you know, my recommendation is that you, you, know, you, don't, you don't get him. Uh, but, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe you want to try, but – you know, they're, they're going to be button heads a little bit, and uh, it, it's, going to be, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting. Uh, Urban, Urban is going to want playmakers, that's for sure. Uh, he's going to want a quarterback that's going to make plays, and wide receivers, he's going to have those. He's got them already. He's got a running back that's balls to the wall. love the kid. So, you know, he's going to, he's going to do what he wants to do but he, he's, he's looking for talent first. If the talent comes with a little edginess to it, it doesn't bother him. <laughs> Jacksonville has $74.9 million, right? They have the most in, in open cap space, salary cap space on any team of the 32 NFL franchises. They have the money. The difference between them and the 10th team as far as, fran- as, far as salary cap space is like $50 million. So Jacksonville by far has this money to go out and spend. I mean, yeah, there's, there's a couple teams, you know, in the top, you know, a team right behind them and whatnot, but the, the discrepancy between one and 10 is, is kind of astronomical. So you got almost 75 million to spend in, in salary cap space. Plus you have 10 draft picks and you have the number one overall pick two number, two first round picks, two second round picks, one in the third round to start things off. I would imagine that, you know, with the right decisions, Jacksonville can maybe turn some things quickly. I'd like so. I'd like to think so. Um, you know, Urban, I've always told you that he's pretty careful when he does some things, except when he, he's in the, in the heat of a battle where he just does some goofy stuff. But he's, um, he has now hired 35 coaches for the staff of Jacksonville. I don't know if that's a – a norm number or not, but 35 coaches or 35 members of his staff, he's now filled it out. Of course, now he's got to find another strength and conditioning coach, but uh, he's got he's, he's got to be smart with it. He's got to be smart with it. I mean, he's certainly got to lean on Trent and say, listen, you know the ropes more than I do. This is what I want to see out of a player. This is what I want to see happen in the draft. This is what I would like to see. I have a group of A players a group of B players and C players and so on. That's how I want to try to address. It. So however you think you can work those deals, let me know so I can give you the person that I want for this particular draft. And uh, he'll be very meticulous about it. He's going to have to be because this is not like recruiting kids in high school. These are men. These are grown men that have their own agenda. And a lot of times they don't mix in a, in a, uh, in a 
<clears throat> locker room, like numbnuts, the few these numbnuts that we had there, Ramsey and those idiots. Um, you notice, the, notice how things happen in Florida State. They got Ramsey's an idiot. <laughs> you know, we got Jameis is an idiot. You know, things that happen in Florida State. I, I hate to chastise all you Seminoles out there, but, you know, it, it, look at Mike Norvell's going to do the job. And I've said this once a week now for the last five weeks. I says, Mike Norvell will in two years have a championship team. Not next year, but in two years. He's already climbing the, uh, he's already number seven in the 2021 uh, draft class already. So he's moving right up the line there and he's getting the kids that he wants to. Uh, but that's, you know, irrespective of that, Urban's got a different deal with us now. Urban is not dealing with kids, he's dealing with men. So he's going to have to really, really going to have to dive into him and say, you know, what are you about? I mean, can you help my team? Uh, are you a high quality guy? I mean, you drink, you smoke, da, 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 you know? So he's he's got to make the decisions and he's got to pull the trigger. He and Trent have got to get this right. Listen, the, the Jaguars have, have, have not been put in such a perilous position as they are right now. We know for a fact, for even going back to the Mark Brunel days, that <laughs> the franchise has been a mess. It's been mismanaged, it's been this, it's been this, and Shad somehow buys into it, spends multi-million dollars to do it. Now he's seeing his fruits. They're not coming out there. Yeah. He had some bad coaching hires. So, you know, with that being said, what what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to you you have got to conform, and you've got to be able to do it the right way. Trent and and Urban cannot miss this draft, and they cannot miss the free agency. They've got to hit home runs, Daniel. They have to. Well, and that's the thing. I mean, now more than ever, I would say that the franchise is on the clock because you know you're you're almost thirty years in the biz. And you've had three shots at going at advancing to, you know, the NFL championship game. You've been to the AFC championship three times, but you know, it, the last time they made it, there was a decade between when they had even made the playoffs before that, you know, and you look at uh, a guy like Mercedes Lewis, who was the only guy that was a part of the original to, you know, the so you don't make the playoffs for a decade. Then you go to the AFC championship game and then the next year you stink, and then you got two years in a row that, like, it took two years to get the wins that it took to get in one year. And, I mean, it's just this haphazard thing where Jacksonville fans have had nothing, 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 something, nothing, 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 nothing. And, you know, so they're they're more used to losing than they are to winning. And, you know, that's obviously something that has to change. The bar is extremely low at 1-15, in you know, it's 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 like being in a relationship and finding out that the guy the guy snored all the time. He peed the bed. He never cooked for her. He left dirty <laughs> underwear on the floor like that bar is so low in Jacksonville that all you really have to do is show up, wash your underwear, clean yourself and maybe make her dinner once or twice. And you're already way above what happened. So, I mean, the bar's low in Jacksonville, but dang it, if those fans don't deserve some type of positive consistency because they sure as heck know what negative consistency looks like. Oh, it's, it's, it's a, <clears throat> well, uh, fortunately I'm going to be right down here, right in the center of things. And I will know what's happening every minute of the day. Now, of course, people around the country could do the same thing because of the internet and everything. But I, I I'm going to be listening very carefully when the camp opens up, I may even drive up there and, and go to the camp, uh, I don't know if they do. Do they let people in? Yeah, they let people in, don't they, for a while? They, well, it depends, I mean, with Corona, but yeah. so usually there's days that allow fans in during normal circumstances. There's it's, usually time. I would like to see that. I, I want to sit there in the stands and I want to visually see, I want to see what these guys are going through. I want to see what Urban is made of. I want to see what all his position coaches are made of. This is, this is something that I want to do. Then I can report to you and say, look, at, this is what I saw. And this is what I think can happen. Yeah. And I would love that. And <laughs> I think you know, being in Northern Florida, I mean, what, what do you hear these days? What is going on? Cause it's almost like there was like no news about anybody in his staff. And then it was just like gangbusters. You know, there was like nothing going on with who he was hiring. And then it's like, here's 30 people. Did it happen that quickly uh, down there? No, it's just 
things have gotten off to a good start, except for what Urban did with this this positioning coach. I mean, you know, he's smarter than that. He should have seen the red flag. He should have said, he should have asked Trent, Trent, is this a good way for me to go with this guy? You know, Trent says, you know, he's got some red flags, Urban. I said, there's plenty of guys out there with, <laughs> with weightlifting experience. Can't you find someone else? Yeah. So it could be the first little little tip that they had. And Urban must have won it, won it because he got the guy, but then Trent won it because he lost the guy. So now they got to start all over again, and now they got to see, look, at, I, I can't – I got to be careful with what I'm doing. He's got to be careful what he's doing on the field and, of, of course, how he treats the men. I'm not sure, you know – as far as I know, Urban has never been a ranter and a raver or anything like that. He's kind of a uh, mellow guy, but he does get his dander up every once in a while. But I can't see that happening uh, in, the, in the locker room of a professional football team. I think there's plenty of ways to do it, to get around it. There's plenty of ways to get your, your players motivated, and there's plenty of ways to get the offensive shape, defensive shape. So, you know, I'm, I'm looking for a mellow side of him, but I'm also looking for a hard side of him to get the right guys in position. Please don't bring these knuckleheads in here that's got two DUIs and beat up their wives. You don't, you don't need those kind of guys. You know, and, and I think with Urban Meyer and this new chapter, I mean, how do you close the chapter on – how did you close the chapter on Doug Marone and how different are him and Urban Meyer in your opinion? Uh, Doug Marone. Doug Marone's a good guy, man. I hate to see it. hate to see what happens to him. He just wasn't given – wasn't given the, the tools to succeed. And uh, you, you cannot like a guy like Doug Moon. I mean, he's just a, a classy guy. He's already got a big time job <laughs> with the best coach in history, Nick Saban. Can you believe that? The guy's out of work one week, and here he goes. He winds up in <laughs> Nick Saban's uh, deal. Doug Moon is. Doug Moon did the best he could with what he had, and he's a, he's a good guy, and I wish him luck. So we're in this Urban Meyer era. Do you draft Trevor Lawrence? Do you draft Justin Fields? There's fans that I think are scared that he'll draft Justin Fields because of his connection to Ohio State. A lot of people are thinking, you know, this is a layup. Just go get Trevor Lawrence and be done with it. What are your thoughts? Well, it's, I've heard some ramblings that he, he likes Justin Fields. But I, I like Justin Fields as not a uh, number one quarterback. I think he's probably going to wind up seventh or eighth or tenth or somewhere down the road there. Uh, he's we, We've talked about this uh, several times now. they got to make a home run. And yeah. the fan base in, in Jacksonville will go absolutely bananas if he doesn't get Trevor Lawrence. Now, Urban's a weird guy, and he do his thing, his own thing, but he, he's got to get Trevor Lawrence. Now – if they want to trade the number one pick already and for another couple more number ones, uh, maybe that's down the road, but Daniel, they have to draft this kid. Yeah. You know, I, I don't, and what do you see from him? You know, you've watched quarterbacks for so long. Uh, what, what do you see from Trevor Lawrence from, from your viewpoint? Well, he's got all the tools. I mean, he's a, like we used to say in baseball, he's a five tool player. You'd have all the things that are good run, hit, hit for average, home run, steal bases. This guy's got them all. He can, he can run. He can throw. Uh, he's got great touch on the ball. He's just, he makes good decisions. I mean, he's just a good, good, strong young man. And he, I always thought maybe he maybe was a little bit brittle uh, when I saw him as a freshman. And I see he came back as a sophomore and then junior. He doesn't look any different. He's still a big, tall, rangy guy with skinny arms. You know, he's, you got to be tough. I mean, he said his six, they say he's 6'6 uh, six, six and 220. 220 to be stretching it. I just hope he doesn't break like a, a twig out there. Uh, but he's going to be smart. I think he's uh, I'm very excited to watch this kid throw the ball around. I want to see him in person. I really do. D.D. Westbrook, D.J. Chark Jr., uh, LaVisca Chenault Jr., uh, all these guys are there, have been there. Jacksonville has kept a relatively young staff at wide receiver through these last few years, and – there's just not bad. I mean, they've either gotten injured. There just hasn't been consistency. <clears throat> Trevor Lawrence comes into Jacksonville and he's got shark and he's got Chanel and he's got Westbrook and whatnot. What does he get with those guys? What does he get with, you know, uh, some of the guys that are even behind them 
that uh, showed up in like third string and, and whatnot. What is what is Trevor Lawrence getting in Jacksonville with the wide receiver core? Well, he's got a he's got a nice group to work with. That uh, he's very very fortunate they have these kids. I love. I told you, Ch- Chenault. Is, I watched him at Colorado. I just love the way this kid played, and I'm glad he's a, a Jaguar. Look at one thing that uh, Trevor Lawrence has that our other quarterbacks didn't have. Uh, maybe not so much Glennon, uh, but he, he throws a long ball. He throws a long ball good. Uh, when you got someone like Chenault or someone who can fly like Chark. You know, if they get five yards on the defensive back, that ball's going to be there. It's going to be on a dime. So I want to see him. I want to see him. I want to see some excitement, <laughs> but I want to see the, the, I want to see the offensive players put in positions for them to make plays. That's all you can do. You know, your offense. Now we know who the offensive coordinator is. Is Daryl Bevel. Did you know that? Yeah. They, Bevel. they gave us yep. a, a big, uh, big release of all the coaches. Yep. Yeah. So he's a, he's a first class guy too. So I don't know what happened to Scott Linehan, but Daryl Bevel is just, just as good a choice. Uh, he's probably licking his chops, being able to look at uh, someone like uh, Trevor Lawrence come in. And then he's got the gardener. you got the Minshew, your man, mustache and all, yeah, headband and all. <laughs> he's going to be – uh, I'll tell you what. I think, I think Urban's going to love him. I think Urban's going to love Minshew, and I think he'll, he'll play him as much as he can. Well, I think what's interesting is, you know, there was a there was a number 15 that Urban got to know in the state of Florida, and that's at Tim Tebow. Now he's got a number 15 in Gardner Minshew that he gets to know in the state of Florida. Does Jacksonville keep him around or do they ship him? Because I found some suitors. There's there's the Patriots, the Jets, the Eagles. There's some teams out Falcons. There's some teams out there that could take a Gardner Minshew on. What do you think? Well, you, with any young quarterback like Trevor Lawrence, you just got to watch out for injuries. That's why I just I hate to see these quarterbacks run. You hear me bitch about it all the time. I just don't want to see him run. And I just dread that guy goes down and doesn't get up. What are we going to do now if we don't have someone there? Please. You almost have to have Gardner Minshew there. Or Glennon. Uh, I'm, I don't see them signing Glennon again. But they'll keep Gardner because he's a character and he knows the offense. But now we said a whole different offense. And. But he he knows the players. He knows he knows what uh, what routes the players like, and uh, who who runs better routes this way. Who's a better deep threat? Um, the tough one. The tough one. Yeah, you know, and I, and I think you know the other thing that whoever comes in at quarterback is inheriting is James Robinson, an undrafted rookie from Illinois State that was in the final five for rookie of the year in the NFL fantastic two touchdowns in a game where they're terrible 70 something yards five yards a carry 100 yards here doing this doing that doing the other thing I picked him up in the middle of the fantasy football season and he was one of the most consistent players I had even when Jacksonville stunk it up he was somehow finding a way to make it good how do you go from undrafted rookie to almost the rookie of the year I mean James Robinson it seems to be something special well obviously the uh the scouts didn't do their job because he, uh, he certainly would have been drafted before that. Uh, this guy has a natural talent for running the ball. I mean, he just, he's, he's tough. He's hard nosed. He runs low. He's like a bowling ball. He reminds me of Jer- uh, Jerome uh, Drew. What's his name? Maurice Jerome uh, Drew, yeah. Yeah. Uh, just a tough, tough guy. Can't arm tackle him. He's going to run right through it. I think that Urban is looking to involve him a lot in the offense. I think you're going to see him a lot of swings out of the backfield. Uh, some, a lot of, uh, uh, other kind of passes uh, that he can handle. And I think that he'll get on uh, good with, with Trevor. They will be screen passes. I mean, I'd like to see this guy. I love to see him get a screen pass because he's so small that he's, he's, he's sitting behind guys that are six, eight, you know, and he's, he's got a little butt back there and he's trying to weave it around. It'd be fun to watch him. The Jaguars in finalizing their coaching staff uh, to let everybody know here. Uh, obviously the head coach, Urban Meyer, uh, offense coordinator, as you said, Daryl Bevel, uh, Joe Cullen, the defensive coordinator, special teams, Brian Schneider, uh, Brian Schottenheimer is a passing game coordinator, Chris Ash, who some people thought was going to get the Syracuse job a few years back, who got the Rutgers job for a short term as the defensive backs coach of the safeties. Tyler Bowen is a tight ends coach. Joe Dana is the defensive backs coach for the Nichols. Uh, Quentin Ganther 
is the offensive quality control coach. Tony Gilbert is the assistant linebackers coach. Will Harriger is the offensive assistant coach. Uh, Sanjay, Sanjay Lal is the wide receivers coach. Sterling Lucas is the assistant D-line coach. Uh, Tosh Lupoy is the defensive line coach. Zachary Orr is the outside linebackers coach. Bernie Parmalee is the running backs coach. Uh, Corliss Carlos, pardon me. Carlos Polk is the special teams assistant. Patrick Riley is the defense quality control coach. Uh, Bob Sutton is the senior defensive assistant. Tim Walton is the secondary corners coach. George Warhop is the offensive line coach. Todd Washington is the assistant O-line coach. And then uh, we have Anthony Schlegel, the head strength and conditioning coach. Brandon Ireland, the assistant strength coach. Adam Potts, the assistant strength coach. Another assistant, uh, Cedric Scott for strength. Chief of staff is Fernando Lovo, the assistant to the head coach, Elizabeth Mayers. And we have Tyler Wolf is the director of team administration. And I left out this name until last because I wanted to know what you thought. I have a connection to this man from Louisville. I have a connection to this man from South Florida. And now he somehow in the small world we live in, I have a connection to the assistant head coach and inside linebackers coach. Right under Urban Meyer, his assistant head coach, Charlie Strong. Thoughts? First class guy. Loved Charlie Strong when he was there as a Gator. Uh, worked, worked for Urban for those four years. Uh, Florida had a super defense when he was there. Of course, they had Tim Tebow scoring a lot of points. But, you know, Urban, he, he won two championships in four years. That tells you the talent level that he had here. But he also had good coaches. Charlie Strong was one. I, I, I hated to see him go because I knew he was going to be successful at Louisville. And then for some reason, you know, he had a good job at Louisville. For some reason, Texas opened up and, you know, they threw $7 million at him or something like this. And uh, he just couldn't cut it. And then, of course, his South Florida is the same way. So I don't know what happened to his, his management skills, but uh, he needs to, uh, he doesn't have to do that well now. He just got to, Urban will tell him what he wants and uh, he'll get it. He, this is, this is an exciting hire for me, and I'm glad that it brings a lot of uh, Florida fans into the mill. Yeah, you know, and I'm excited for this, too, seeing this uh, connection as the staff uh, really has come together in Jacksonville as we move forward. So the Jaguars doing their thing, P.J. doing his thing. And, P.J., you know, before I let you go from this Florida in focus, I want to do something that I typically let other people uh, you know, when people, when people come on the show, when I have a guest that's on every, you know, uh, we do a thing called rapid fire. You and I have done it before. We're in Florida. We're in the Sunshine State. My new logo has the sun <laughs> rising out of the coffee cup. Shout out to Mark Products here in Syracuse, right on Court Street. And shout out to my guy, John Grenquist, that helped bring my graphics to life. But rapid fire, putting on the hot seat, three questions. You can ask me anything in the world you want to ask me. It doesn't have to do with sports. But we're going to end this Florida and Focus special from down in the Sunshine State with you giving me three questions. I got to answer them all. It doesn't matter what they are whenever you're ready. Okay. Well, with your broadcasting background, is there any way that you would get an advanced degree in your field? You know, I thought about getting a graduate degree before, and one of my teachers, my mentor, Mary Beth Holmes, she said to me, she kind of picked up the reins when uh, my buddy Jay Hammerin passed away. And Mary Beth said to me, you would be doing yourself a disservice getting a graduate degree. You have learned all that you can learn. You have challenged yourself and you have to get out into the real world. So she pushed me to do that. But I have thought about being an adjunct professor before and using my 17 plus years of knowledge and wisdom, hopefully, and, uh, and be able to maybe teach some kids here and there where I can. That's, that's good. That's good. That's a good answer. I didn't realize it because we've never spoke about that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Second question? Yep. Second question. You got me on the button. Okay, I'll tell you what. Here it is. Give me the final record for Jaguars in their onset season with Urban Meyer. I'm going to say, this is tough. I know my first answer, but I think it's too high. 
I'm going to say six and ten or seven and nine. Six and ten or seven and nine. Now that's a that's a good one. Now um, the most important question I have, of course, is: Do you still have Chick Fil A as an as a sponsor? We very proudly have Chick Fil A Cicero here with us in the community. They have partnered with us in the community. Uh, Jim Rusakowski, a good friend and a terrific leader in our community, 7916 Brewerton Road in Cicero. And uh, they have been absolutely fantastic. Uh, people have been great to them. They've been great during the pandemic. They put a giving card outside where you could either live, leave something for a family or take something that you needed. Uh, they, even though they have the, you know, kind of universal Chick-fil-A name, a Chick-fil-A Cicero has essentially functioned like a local company in Jimmer's desire to help the community and be there for the community. So I love my spicy chicken deluxe. I love the nuggets. I love the Cobb salad. And of course my uh, peppermint chip shake, but, uh, <laughs> more, but more than anything else, I love that they're faith forward. I love that Jimmer came back to our community and I, I love the fact that we get to uh, work together and talk about faith and positivity because it's really, uh, really means a lot to me to have, uh, to have Chick-fil-A connected uh, with me because it's a, it's a place that I've wanted for, I don't know, 12 or 13 years to work with. And it means the world to me that I got to. And I still remember the day where they put the Chick-fil-A logo on the building and it was snowing. And I went around the corner and I took a picture and sent it to you and Mary. And I was like, I still don't believe it until it opens. And of course it's been here for a few years now. I have good news in St. Augustine. Yeah. On Route 16, it's the other end of town, north of town, a new Chick-fil-A is built. It'll be opening very shortly. So I'm happy about that. We need, we got two Chick-fil-A's in St. Augustine now. Oh, and, that, and that's good to know because the Chick-fil-A that you have is a really small parking lot where you're like, if you have to back up, you're like going into the drive through But I love the one over there. So now that there's, you know, a Chick-fil-A this way and a Chick-fil-A that way, you and I will be, uh, you and I, Mary T, Joe, uh, Meatball number one will be set because uh, I know that when I come down there, I like to get you a Chick-fil-A sandwich. Well, did, did I tell you that they revamped their whole parking area? You told me that they were doing it, yeah. They did, and they, they grew it out to, towards where Sonny's is. They must have bought that little area. That, and they, they pushed another lane out there. Oh, good. So now there's, there's a lane for parking. There's two, there's two lanes for drive through and one lane to go through. You can't, any time of the day when you go through Chick-fil-A on US-1, it doesn't stop. It's, it's constant. The drive through lines are constant. It's amazing. And what, what a product they have. I, I, I love it. Yeah, I think it's, it's been really incredible to see what they've done here. We have the two lanes that lead into one, and there's a lot of greats. I mean, it's, it's, it's just jam-packed all the time as if it just opened. So shout out to Chick-fil-A, Cicero. For Papa Joe, this is Florida in Focus. This was your Thursday, February 25th special. Our week in Florida, our week in our second home of the show, the second hub of Wake Up Call is down in the Sunshine State. And I want to thank Florida for welcoming me back as they always do with open arms. Hashtag Wake Up Call OTR, Wake Up Call on the road and Wake Up Call everywhere. For Papa Joe, I am Dan Tortora and PJ, Thank you for being a part of our signature series on the road in Florida. Oh, I love it, Daniel. Good luck with it. <laughs>